Jeremy Tate is founder and director of the Classic Learning Test, the most rigorous, accurate, and user-friendly college entrance exam available to students today. Jeremy is also host of the Anchored Podcast. I'd encourage you to check that out, featuring discussions at the intersection of education and culture. Welcome, Jeremy. Erica, thanks so much for having me. It's great to connect. Uh, parent of six, I'm a fellow, a mom of six, and we were just talking about what it's like to have older high school students. Yes. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. I am as well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So looking ahead to our discussion, I would like you to just, if you could take a minute to familiarize our listeners with the CLT, can you tell us a little bit about the test, why yeah. you took on this huge project, and how is it similar or different to from the SAT ACT. Yeah, Erica, thanks so much. And, and kind of explain what the CLT is, even and why it exists. And it's one of the things that, that happened with this study that came out as we realized, well, a lot of people still haven't heard of this, that there is an alternative to the SAT. It's kind of helpful to just tell the two minute backstory for how CLT even came about. Uh, in 2014 15, uh, I was running an SAT ACT prep company. Uh, I was working as a college counselor uh, at Mount DeSales Academy. Uh, Dominican run school uh, in Catonsville, Maryland, which is where my do- two of my daughters go right now. And uh, had had previously before that read my way into the Catholic Church uh, while at a very reformed uh, Calvinist seminary was not what I was planning on doing in seminary. <laughs> and so I got into SAT prep to just you know put food on the table. We had four kids at that point, and I was very surprised getting to know the College Board not just through the PSAT and the SAT. Uh, but but uh, really through AP as well. And I would describe the College Board first and foremost as the most powerful, the most influential company in American mm-hmm. education. Uh, and College Board is not neutral. Uh, College Board, I would describe as very ideological. Uh, I think politically they are far, far, far left of center. Uh, and I think they push a lot of ideas and they also censor a lot of ideas. AP US, AP Euro, I think they, they neglect uh, the contributions of uh, the Church uh, of Western Civilization itself. Uh, the National Association of Scholars did a study recently on uh, China's influence on uh, AP Chinese culture class. Uh, and it's very much whitewashing uh, the bad stuff and presenting a very rosy picture. During this time, Mount of Sales realized, wow, there needs to be a competitor to the College Board. And really, one of the ways that it happened was that everything we did at this, this great Catholic school to market for new students, almost all of it was connected to the College Board. We were saying, this is our average SAT score, our average PSAT score, or here's how many APs we offer. And when it really, really hit the road, Erica, was when these Dominican sisters introduced uh, an intro to philosophy. And hardly any of the girls wanted to take it. And so as a, as mm-hmm. a college counselor, I was talking to him about this. Well, why don't you want to take this class? We're talking about the big things. What is life? What is happiness? What is right. meaning? I would have jumped Yeah, and, and the reason was that it was not uh, five AP points, right? It's going to hurt their GPA Whoa, for yeah. our top students. And that right. was this wake up, like, what are we doing? Here we've got as this faithfully Catholic school is in tension with this, in many ways, aggressively secular uh, education empire. And so the, the CLT launched by saying, hey, you know, if there was an alternative to the SAT and ACT, uh, would that solve needs for colleges? And so because I was also a college counselor, quickly called up buddies at Franciscan and Ave and Benedictine and said, hey, if there was an alternative to the SAT and ACT that better reflected a Thomas Aquinas College education, would you change your admission standards? And right away they said, absolutely. We would love something that, that reflected Amazing. Christian or TAC. So that was the beginning uh, mm-hmm. kind of of our story. So now, I mean, the CLT has just taken off. I love going on your website every, you know, couple of years. I have I have kids going through high school, and just seeing as you add schools that accept the CLT as part of their admissions process, um, and also as a mom with my own daughter, uh, when she was prepping for the CLT, and now I have another daughter doing the same. Uh, just she's reading C.S. Lewis, and she's trying. She's reading, um, you know, these greats it's the great conversation that it's really forcing her to enter into the great conversation in order to uh, prepare for this exam so so thank you on a personal well, note, I, I love to hear I, that feedback <laughs> as well and, and is one of the things you wanted to do is redeem all of this wasted time during prep and yeah. instead of you know learning these silly tricks let's have students reading the very very best of what has been thought and said and that way that that time becomes meaningful so so thank you that that mm-hmm. makes my morning Erica for that feedback Oh, of course. All right. So I want to take a quick look at this. Um, uh, Houston Christian University did an analysis of your your test scores 
for the CLT. Um, and I'll, I'll link the whole study in the show notes. But it, it, people ask, okay, how do I prep for this college exam? Because they want to do well. Well, it might be the best idea might be to homeschool your kids, right? So homeschool students who took the CLT exam earned mean scores of roughly 78 points, uh, surpassing private school students who earned mean scores of 75 and charter school students with 73. Public school students earned mean scores of 66, marking the lowest among the cohorts that were considered. Now, Jeremy, what's a perfect score on the Perfect CLT? score is 120, and that has only happened right, once, so, and it was a homeschooler. <sighs> That's amazing. So looking at these kinds of results, and it must be fun at this point to be, to be at a place where you can actually look at these kind of long-term analyses. Um, but looking at these, what do you think it is about the homeschool students um, that give them such an advantage on this test? And to play devil's advocate a little, is the test kind of, you know, biased towards homeschool? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. You know, I I don't think so. I I think something really different happens when you're, when you're reading to, and I haven't, I haven't read much research on this, but when you're reading out of enjoyment or out of leisure, I'm a big fan of Dr. Christopher Perrin over at Classical Academic Press. Yeah. And and a lot of his work, he focuses on the connection. I mean, even the etymology of school comes from the Greek word for leisure and for rest. Scola. Scola, mm-hmm. exactly. And and so I think homeschool students, and we're homeschooling two of our six right now, but it's a very different experience. And and I never I don't want to bash schools. I don't want to bash our, our Catholic schools or even public schools. But you know, when my especially my nine year old, you know, when he's just having the freedom to read because he's just interested and when he got a chance to pick out that book, you know. And I think something special happens then. It's it's curiosity. I, I love the stories of, of you know Benjamin Franklin. He was he was eating less food to have more money for books as a thirteen year old. Hmm. You know he realized he could get by right. on one meal a day to have. I'm like, how does that happen? That a mind becomes <laughs> so hungry for knowledge. Uh, and and uh, so I, I think it is a cultural difference more than anything else. Uh, that and just even the time that is spent. You know, my, my daughter is good at Mountain Hills Academy, run by Dominicans, great school. Mm-hmm. But, you know, by the time they, they get up, get ready, get their school uniforms on, get out the door, it's 45 minutes each way. There's a lot of time just in transition versus my nine year old right. gets up, grabs his book, grabs a bowl of cereal <laughs> and he's off. He's 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 at it. That's awesome. That sounds like my nine year old's yeah. life right now, too. Um, I think, yeah, that idea of having leisure time uh, is so important and so countercultural. So well. countercultural. That's a great um, way to put it. So so countercultural, and it's something I think parents, as a mom, wanting to be aware of our children. Not just um, it's it, you know I think leisure can be mistaken for just boredom or letting them do their own thing or lack of discipline, but but it's not. It's that sort of structured rest into your day that that's prioritizing the life of the mind and the life of the soul. And how cool is it that we have this test that's designed to pin to find those students who have cultivated that life of the mind? Is that a fair? Uh, it is, and, and it's you know what we're doing. People ask this question a lot. You know, it, and it's a great question you ask. Is is the CLT bias in favor of homeschool students, or even classically educated students? Mm-hmm. I think that, that raises well. What what is actually on the CLT? What are students doing? You know, and and what they're yeah. doing is is we like to say they're reading and we're, we're testing their ability to comprehend the very best of what has been thought and said. We, we, we can talk about the math as well uh, in a moment, but that's what we're doing on the verbal mm-hmm. side, on the grammar writing side. So students are, they're reading Dante, they're reading, you know, uh, Jane Austen, they're reading Flannery O'Connor, mm-hmm. or, or even Thomas Aquinas, Augustine. The SAT and ACD hardly ever go before the early 20th century. And we're, we're going all the right. way back to, to Plato's dialogues. Uh, we've had uh, on a number of CLT iterations before. Uh, and so if there's a familiarity, if there's kind of a fluency with uh, those sorts of texts, those students are going to do uh, a, a lot better. And I think that's what we've seen in the results. And it, it's kind of amazing now, seven years, we launched uh, in December of 2015. We just had our seven-year birthday. Uh, that CLT mm, now is, is more and more. We just see it referenced in academic journals or various places as um, as kind of a, a resource. And, and one other thing I'd say with this, you know, when I was growing up, I have very clear memories of them teaching us that the metric system was going to replace, you know, inches and centimeters. 
and think, I remember that very yeah, well. Yeah, right? exactly. And it never, it never actually happened, but they made sure that we knew it. And, uh, but I, we were, I was always waiting for this switch to happen and it never, it never <laughs> really happened. And, but I, I would describe that that idea is exactly what we're trying to do with CLT because mm-hmm. a lot of folks are still measuring academic success with these measuring sticks of the SAT, the PSAT, the ACT. And our argument is mm-hmm. no, the, te- the, the measuring stick itself is deeply flawed and problematic, uh, not just um, as, a, as a test, as a metric, but also mm-hmm. the kind of source material that they're putting in front of students and what they're not putting in front of students. The SAT right now, right. Uh, it, it assumes students have a certain uh, view of the world. I mean, it really does. I mean, the number of passages where you're supposed to assume that basically every woman was miserable until the 1970s. Yep. Right. right. <laughs> and like, that's not everybody's <laughs> take on the world. Right, exactly. Yeah, kind of along those lines. Um, it's the time of year for bold predictions. So I guess another um, another theme we're seeing in the news pop up quite a bit is this move away from standardized tests. And, you know, some top universities in the United States actually saying they're not going to look at the test or going test optional in terms of admissions. So I guess my question to you as a founder of a standardized test, what do you see as one, the drive behind that sort of going away from standardized tests? Is it is it indicative of just the sort of recognition that the SAT and ACT are no longer good metrics? Or is it a move away from tests in general? And if so, uh, what does that say for the future of the CLT? It's a great question. Yeah, the, the history of standardized testing is a long one. I mean, this started really up in, in Maine, you know, Bowdoin College, Bates, you know, 1960s. It's been around oh. for a long time and it slowly uh, spread. Uh, and then what happened is that during COVID, well, it, it really started spreading with the, the, the housing market collapse in 2008. All right. So basically mm-hmm. from the end of World War II mm-hmm. all the way to 2008, you essentially have 60 or so years of growth, more and more students wanting to go to college. Uh, and that's really when colleges become highly selective because you have you know, more applicants than seats available, especially at well-known prestigious mm-hmm. institutions. So the test became very, very, very important. But then in 2008, uh, there was the first really downturn in students applying to college and the test more and more was seen as a barrier uh, for a lot of colleges saying, we don't need to be selective. We just need students. We need, in some cases, anybody, right? Uh, Some colleges uh, have seen, you know, seriously declining (laughs) enrollment. But at the same time, it's a huge problem. The Ivies, University of Chicago, now top, top tier institutions have gone test optional. And that's connected to something a a little bit different. After George Floyd, uh, Congressman Bowman on the floor uh, of the House uh, said that standardized testing has been a pillar of systematic racism in America. Yeah. If there is one thing colleges don't want to be, it's it's racist, all right? And so uh, very quickly, uh, and that was also combined with the fact that tests were hard to come by during early COVID, right? And so colleges kind of had to waive their fees. So very abruptly, we went from 30-ish percent test optional to 92% test optional within about 18 mm. months. It was it was wild how fast it happened. Now, for CLT, it's a win and a loss. In some ways, it puts us on equal footing. We have a great relationship with Duke. Duke says, sure, if kids want to send us their CLT score, we'll take a look, absolutely, as we would an SAT or mm-hmm. ACT, but we'll also take a tap dancing video or whatever else they might want to send us, right? So we're like, okay, does that yeah. make you a partner or not? It's, it's a little bit more vague. But now we've also seen something new just in the past six or eight months. First, MIT and now Purdue going back to requiring a test. Uh, I can't say them on air, but I I do know of a couple very well-established institutions that will be going back to requiring a test. It'll probably be announced in April or May. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, the way I would describe it, Erica, is that I I think the pendulum has swung as far as it's going to swing against testing. And it's going to swing back a little bit, but not nearly as far as it once was. And I to the same extreme. Yeah, and I actually think that's a good thing. I mean, my, my generation, it yeah. was almost like your SAT score was like branded on your forehead. You know, it was like yes, I'm a 1030 my whole life now, and like it's written. Here, yeah, yeah, it's like no, you're not a 1030. <laughs> that's like your silly score yeah. on one test. So it's one indicator. Yeah, yeah. so so it's kind of like this overreaction of like, okay, is a test score helpful? Yeah, it gives a snapshot into where a student's at in some key academic areas at a given moment in time. But it's not a whole lot more than that either, right? 
And when, mm-hmm. we, when we, we made it even culturally in America, like these SAT and ACT scores are so crucial. I don't think it was good for people. I don't think it was healthy. I don't think it was good psychologically for, for students. So that's where we would love for it to come back is a test score is going to be mm-hmm. one. But what we really launched, though, primarily, uh, not, not because we thought a college entrance exam was the most awesome thing in the world, but more because we thought that that is where mainstream curriculum that is the main driver of a lot of curriculum mm. is what's on the PSAT right. and SAT. And so we thought, you know what, if you had a competitor to these tests uh, that was requiring students to read from the great tradition, and we have seen that. I mean, some of the best conversations we've had is, have been actually with Catholic schools where they've said, okay, Jeremy, mm-hmm. we, we piloted the CLT and now we want to go all in, but we've got to make some major changes to our curriculum. Our students need to be reading more philosophy. They need to be reading more church fathers. And that, that yeah. is the very best feedback in the world. And, and with that as well, we're also seeing CLT utilized more and more. Actually, not even more and more. It's almost uh, 75% utilized not as a college entrance exam. Uh, it's u- mm-hmm. utilized as an internal metric, often for homeschool families, uh, but for schools mm-hmm. as well to track kind of year-over-year uh, progress. That's amazing. So you're looking at a college entrance exam as one of the primary, I don't know, big guns, if you will, on the culture war front. Like that, that's what sure. I'm hearing. Yeah. Like who would have thought? It, it, it sounds you know, strange wanna... when you think about it, but, but this, this yeah. whole experience, Eric, over the past seven years has been kind of just like, I would describe it as grabbing like a piece of string and then you realize there's this massive cobweb that's like attached to it. Because <laughs> the, it has, the college board Boy. has tentacles everywhere, everywhere. I mean, yeah. it's shocking. It is very much immersed and and, I mean, all the way to like driving insurance, like the most random Mm -hmm. things that you would never expect of like, that's connected to SAT score and your discounts and everything else. So, so it it really is. And and it it communicates something, you know, I I went to to Louisiana state undergrad before seminary and as an ed major, which is a terrible major, never do that. If you're listening to this, (laughs) go to Christianum, go to Hillsdale, major in the classics or, or, you know, go to a great books Mm -hmm. college, you know, like Thomas Aquinas. Um, but, but one of the, the meaningful classes we took was a history of education. And in that, we also talked about that standardized testing, but you're only ever taught to look at standardized testing as an evaluative mm-hmm. tool, but it's, it's really mm-hmm. also a pedagogical tool, right? In in a couple of ways, I mean, right. test, tests teach, and they also convey to students what is important and what isn't important. Exactly. And that's what we see the whole teach to the test. Well, if the test is noble and worthy of the human person, you're going to be teaching good stuff. Amen. Yeah. And so. that, that, that is absolutely our goal. And, and you know, we, we've got an author bank, two thirds of all of the passages on the CLT uh, come from the CLT author mm-hmm. bank. We've got a great uh, board of academic advisors and they can arm wrestle and shout over who is on that author bank and who isn't. But it's anywhere from Boethius, yeah. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine. We're not a, a quote unquote Catholic company, but we definitely, we would say we lean into the Catholic intellectual tradition, mm-hmm. because it is the tradition uh, of the West. It truly is. Yeah, to back it up a little bit. So it seems like the CLT then is sort of part of this wider alternative education movement um, that started well before COVID, right? But since you brought up the COVID, the lockdowns, um, how do you see COVID as accelerating maybe um, parents around the country, their openness to maybe alternative education. So, you know, a lot of people, they grew up in the public schools, did fine for me. I was in a good public school. My kids can go, you know, you set up your life around, you're going to send your kids to public school. But then we see post COVID, um, this sort of accelerated growth in homeschooling, interest in classical education, these other alternative forms of education. I was hoping, you know, just as someone who's in that space, you could speak to what you see as the root causes of that acceleration, it would probably be good to actually start with kind of a kind of a bit of history. It's funny we we CLT works very closely with uh, the classical Christian school movement, and that that's overwhelmingly we're mm-hmm. talking about Protestant institutions, and they really mark the beginning of this movement to kind of the founding of the Logos School in Idaho and and Doug Wilson and Christ Church out there. Um, I I would really mark it as a Catholic actually with the founding of, of Thomas Aquinas College, uh, and this is mm-hmm. ten years before that in, in 1972. Uh, and essentially, it was four professors. Uh, Laura Burkwest's husband, Mark, was one of them. And there was kind of an yeah. academic project in terms of like what would an authentically Catholic college look like in the modern world. And TAC is what they they come up with, and they've been so true to that to that mission and vision now for for fifty right. years. It's it's very faithful. It's just amazing. 
Um, but, you know, so this movement started off very slowly. And what we had going in the 80s and 90s is just kind of a trickle of a few, uh, the homeschooling movement, the first data we have is 1973. It's about 13,000 mm -hmm. then. It's over 5 million today. So just explosive growth on the homeschooling side. Yeah, exponential yeah. growth. Yeah. And then you had the, the classical Christian schools beginning to start in, in the early 80s, but really not until the, the, the late 90s. You have a, a really a noticeable number. Uh, and that continues with the, 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 the digital age. And so when we enter into the, the Internet age in the year 2000, it's easier to become aware. Uh, we had Doug Wilson on our podcast not long ago and just hearing him describe mm -hmm. how you're it's so wild. It seems like a different world now to us because we're so used to, to this. But it's like, yeah, I mean, you, it was very hard to know what was happening in other parts of the country in terms of this mm -hmm. ed alternative education movement. So the internet has connected all of these movements together. And I also think it's one of the unintended things that CLT has done in terms of we've tried to, we've tried to galvanize the classical charter world. We try to galvanize the Catholic world, the homeschool world, the classical Christian school world in order to kind of pick this fight with the college board, yeah. to, you know, and with the education establishments. <laughs> we're like, we need all the friends we yeah. can get because like we need to lock yeah. arms with like-minded people here. Uh, yeah. And then, and then the movement really kind of exploded with, with COVID. Uh, and so you had, the Zoom classroom came into everyone's home uh, and parents mm -hmm. weren't impressed. And in some time, in some cases, they were horrified with what their son or daughter was being taught. And so we yeah. are we are still experiencing a mass exodus. And it's, it's really wild. I mean, the, the, the media doesn't cover this story hardly at all. Fox News has covered this, but for the most part, the media is not telling this story. We're talking about serious uh, a serious exodus happening out of New York City public schools, uh, California public schools, especially the ones that have become kind of fanatical ideologically uh, and are pushing things yeah. that five years ago would have seemed wild to almost any American are yeah. now being taught as just, you know, as, as true. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting too um, when I talk to people about classical education or the homeschool movement, um, I hear from you know, more secular friends. Oh, well, that's just kind of like a rich white people's movement. But you uh, actually look at the demographics yeah. <laughs> and the, the largest cohort of homeschooling families right now are actually in the African yes. community, the black communities. Um, and so it, it's it's such an untold story. That is so, that is so and, true. It is, I can't yeah. help but laugh when I hear that because, I mean, the, pre the president yeah. of our board, Angel Adams Parham, yeah. Yale graduate, PhD, professor at the University of Virginia, until last year, she homeschooled her own kids in the, in the classical Christian mm -hmm. tradition, you know, and she's, she's not mm -hmm. alone uh, in doing this. And so it, it again, it's, it's a story that the mainstream media won't tell that story, but it's 16% yeah. right now of black families are homeschooling and they mm -hmm. outperform their public school peers on reading comprehension tests by over 40%. Think about that. Over 40% is mind boggling. Yeah. Blah. And, and, you know, right. I, I spent almost 10 years in the public school arena and you hear a lot about the achievement gap. Well, that, that is the number one achievement gap that I've ever heard. The difference between black mm -hmm. homeschool kids and black public school students. Right. And um, I mean, right. it, it, it really is. So I think we are living through right now the most um, the, 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 the most rapid change disruption uh, of American education, I think, in our history. Right. And in a good way. In a great way, I think. Absolutely. We're, go we're going with some good news yeah. here. Um, well, that was, this has been so encouraging. And I would encourage all of our listeners to check out the CLT at cltexam.com. And even if you don't have um, school-age children, even if this is not your demographic right now, I think um, this conversation has totally convinced me that this is a movement, not just a test. And it's very important that we all be aware of the good work being done by everyone at CLT. Jeremy, thank you so much. Erica, what, what an honor uh, to be on the show. Love to come back in the future. And thanks for all the good work uh, that you're doing. 